areas today. I saw very deep connections and correlations to that. And it struck me that uh, this is a pattern. This is a historic pattern, but this has also been a historic policy, you know, a de facto type of policy and also just an actual law that you can just do that. Uh, think about the lies, the betrayal, the, the deception that took place. You know, I think they said over 300 plus treaties. Think about that, 300 plus treaties. I mean, that's a lot of treaties. And they say over two, two million plus land well, of acres. I mean, that's a lot of land and acres that was, you know, forced through lies, through violence. And then you talk about, you know, the names, you know, John Shivington created as a hero. You know, this is how people get their information at this time. This was the great market. So this is a marketing scheme to bring people to the West. This is what you can do to get land. And this is what we're going to allow you to do to get land. You know, and I think about this idea of gentrification. This is a very early model and precursor, in my opinion, of gentrification. You know, uh, you connect this to Michelle Alexander's book, New Jim Crow. This was an early also version of the West of Jim Crow, you know. And then you think about, you know, how black people put in a very peculiar situation after slavery. Um, well, and also during slavery, you know, do I join the Union War and go over here and fight these indigenous people or do I remain a servant? In these horrible conditions. I don't know what you do. I, I mean, I'm not saying it was, I'm no moral compass for that particular area. But I think that that also is another element. So within this, you know, reading this book, I saw deep correlations. And as a historian, it also expanded my worldview and uh, about looking at the indigenous. They finally, you know, this book also it laments on their humanity. You know, they were diverse people. You know, they had conflict, but there was a way that they dealt with their conflict that I think is very peculiar about this book. That when the Europeans came, we don't, you know, you know, we don't, we don't handle conflict in us. We decimate, we eliminate, we take. Them, it was like, yo, you know, um, this idea about the land too. You know, I, I think we call it their land, but in their mind, it was never their land. You know, I think it was one of their great elders uh, that said, you know, the land is the land is whoever's who created. So it was this idea about their creation, you know, their idea about the way that they saw their environment, the earth. That was another thing for them. That was another thing that they had to justify. And this idea about religion. Religion's tied to this too. So all of these, all of these layers and issues that I saw is very relevant today. And it takes and and is very relevant and prevalent today. And the uh, campaign race today, you know, has this origin somewhere in this particular time, in this particular era. So, you know. Uh, I was thinking as you were talking about how, um, you know, I had heard also that uh, when claiming this claims are claims in great fields, I look like it, it was truly manifest destiny and God had appeared this earth for them. But I, I guess I just never stopped to think about how large a civilization uh, of towns, the, the, the connection of towns, you know, of course, I knew about the Incas and the Aztecs, lunch, but I didn't think about just cities. It's cities with people who live in the cities and farm uh, right outside. It's many, 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 as she mentioned, uh, those uh, are uh, teeth mentioned. The other city is just like this one. I mean, just, just cities where people lived in it, just mind their own business. And Andrew Jackson, you know, just, hey, you got to go. Because there's a way that Colin is coming. So it wasn't just the Plains Indian who, who did move around. There were, there were groups who were just stuck in, not stuck in, who lived in cities just like we do here. And then all of a sudden somebody comes to the outskirts and says, you got it back. And I, whatever it took, that they usually did, leave that area and look someplace else. So um, I just looked at, oh, she just, I mean, she didn't have malice in her heart when she spoke about it. She just spoke about what we all know. Because you can intuit that. Well, yeah, every single group has a, uh, a group that wondered. There, there must have been people who just stayed in one location in great cities, like the large city templates. Um, 
And then another thing when she mentioned about the police today, the police today are to protect and serve. Um, that's the job of the police to protect and serve. But when she said, but in some communities that see police force is the militia, I went, wow, yeah, that's what some police, the policing in certain areas in certain cities, the police have a, a militia mentality, not a, a protect and serve mentality. And, and when she said that, it, in that malicious group of people um, who just wanted to be malicious, some of them didn't even get paid. And it was out of the militias that um, fighting groups were um, <coughs> came out of that. And, uh, and the police came out of that. It, she just just walked it right on down and included everything. So I appreciate the way she unfolded it. I was, I didn't get very far, but I was so impressed to recognize, not to recognize, to learn that the original indigenous peoples had a whole system of roads, that they had, um, I mean, one of the statistics uh, the author quoted was something like 100 or 150 years after this, the white settlers came, the forests in this country were in much worse shape because they had looked like English parks. They had been, the undergrowth had been culled, so you could hunt, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And to me, that's just a staggering fact. And also that our major highways are on those roads. Those roads today, 70 is on one of those connector cities, our indigenous city roads. And I will also add, the, um, along with the roads and the cities, but a whole government of system. They had confederacies, you know, sovereign nations, mm -hmm. groups. I mean, that, that's highly sophisticated. That's a highly sophisticated, complex, complex society that you're dealing with to have people come together in one unison. And we're talking about millions of indigenous across this country that had this cohesion of what government was. So, I mean, I think that's also an important fact. The thing that stood out for me is, uh, You know, white America portrays this country in a certain way. You know, there's this kind of nice picture of who we are. And uh, I, I would say we're actually horrid, and we continue to be. And I'm not separating myself from that because I feel like I, I get privileged constantly by being white. Um, like a, a good example is carrier. Carriers, that rapacious uh, exploitation, carriers moving, a lot of black folks here make a decent salary working for carrier. And they're taking thousands and thousands of jobs out of this area to Mexico so they can make a little more money. They're already profitable, but they want more. You know, to me, that's just, it's the same thing that we're not this kind nation, you know, that we're, we're the Trump phenomena, the Cruz phenomena, that othering of people. Uh, this is who we are, you know. We did genocide and stole land. And then we did slavery. And then we did Jim Crow. And then we did the new Jim. We're not this nice people. We're, we're a people that is rapacious and exploitive, and we want to act like we're actually something else. You know, we want to act like we're the light of the world for democracy and freedom and fair play. And that's just not, not I just, we're, and whatever other group you take, Latinos, Blacks, we whites are deeply dependent in who we are on that othering in all sorts of ways. The violence, you know, the economic violence, the housing. I mean, if you look at, you can go to any area, housing, law enforcement, medical, all of those. Whites get a lot better and all the groups that are othered get a lot worse. 
We're running the same game. It's the same game we're running. And, and those of us who think we're radical or liberal, you know, we're benefiting from it every day. It's not true that I don't benefit it, no matter what I have in my head, no matter what consciousness I have. I'm benefiting from it. It's kind of like, I kind of like, uh, uh, whiteness is kind of like a balloon, you know, it pumps white people up. It's like air is, I've been pumped up, you know, I'm way bigger than I am. And if whiteness went away, the balloon would just go and I wouldn't be a professor, you know, I'd be something else. I'd be struggling economically, you know, I, my, my life, all of the things I get to be, a huge percentage of that was created by whiteness, by, by being a white male, by being, you know, heterosexual white male to an able white male, you know, that I get taken care of at this incredible level that Every day I get taken, to have me taken care of subtracts, damages, hurts other people. It's, it's a trade-off. My balloon goes up, theirs goes down. Their pain goes up. That's, and, and we don't want to look at that. We don't want to look at the daily. The violence is incredible. It's incredible in our schools. It's destroying kids' spirits. We live in this hugely violent world hugely violent, and then we have this face, particularly we white people have this face that we're nice people, we're a good people, we're a fair people, we're the light of the world. Yeah, you know, you don't have to spread your love around. <laughs> <laughs> got some, got some here. They, 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 None they, of my they, students they, are here. They're going to get the rebound. And, 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 hold on, hold on. They're going to get the rebound and they're going to take a shot. They're going to get another shot. So part of your job is to facilitate. After Ms. Ferris speaks, so she is the hostess with the most. Uh, you know, encourage and even selection folks to say something. You know, some of them are just shot. But I, a suggestion. I just wanted to, to add that, you know, I think that in today's world with uh, mass media, uh, some sensitization and awareness is coming along. But it is, it is just, I mean, as a youngster in the 40s in the South, I was born in 1943, it was like, don't want white friends to see, don't they just see? But I, I think that now uh, there are, are, are there's understandings and um, there, it, uh, as with me, realizing that there were large cities, not the average, but there were very large cities of the difference. The mighty mountains were already taken care of, and then they, they were forced away. And, just realizing that white privilege exists. It, I can imagine I've had discussions uh, with one gentleman especially who was, he almost came unglued at the idea of white privilege because he, felt like his no life, <laughs> cause he felt like his life had been so hard. And while his life might have been very hard, white privilege <clears> exists. And I think that with the next book conversation that we're gonna have, Tommy Lisi's open letter to his son, in that book, he says to his son, to his 15-year-old black son, you did not create racism. You cannot fix or get rid of racism. That's straight. White people have to do this. And so I think that just for white people to be aware, for white people to take it serious about their inclusion, into humanity and not their being off to the side from humanity. I mean, you know, an, an individual white person might feel like, you know, well, hey, I'm just trying to do all that I can. I absolutely really appreciate that. But it's, it's, it's the, the more, in Tanahisi's book at the end, he says, that white privilege is killing us all. White privilege is killing us all. I privileged corporations who felt like they were privileged to dump in ways. I privileged 
feeling like they can make as much money as they want in foreign stock. I mean, there, there's, there's, there's lakes of of cheese and and mountains of beef that can't even be put on the market because it would adjust the price and make it go down. White white privilege says we got to keep the prices up so that we can keep getting rich. And even in white privilege, there are those who have everything, and white people who have very little, but they're white privilege. So white privilege is killing us out. So when that was one of the things that really made me feel so aware of the fact college has calmed down and thing you can do about racism. Thank hey, and you never want to have white privilege. So I feel like just to help others and just a white friend, you can have the white privilege. <laughs> <laughs> it don't work like that. A white a white mama, a white mama don't give a black kid any kind of white ones. I think I share the white privilege. Kids who say they mix, that's their real. That's the same for being black. Your white mom say you can be black. I use that with white privilege all the time. We do. I say I use that white privilege all the time. But anyway, I just I just wanted to say that while white privilege is real, uh, it's it's just me to get that word out that it's dangerous too. At any whatever point, I just get, let you know. Take on me at some point. I would like to hear from young people in the audience. Amen. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, I'm on the spot here. Um, <clears throat> you're one of the young people. Um, like I said, I haven't really read the book, but from what I've been hearing others say, um, and from what I've read from different books. I'm talking about violence. So, um, violence from whites, blacks, 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 whites, whites, it don't matter what, violence is a very powerful thing. Um, <clears throat> it's not always about violence, though. Um, it depends on the person that is in. that's doing the violence. So, uh, you know, one of the uh, points that was made uh, that interested me was that, uh, I, I think this is what you said, um, you know, the reaction of a lot of the First Nations people to the uh, invasion of the white, the colonization of the white uh, people was uh, was very violent. It was like declaring war. But then when you look at the whole picture, um, this is there's this unexplainable almost uh, um, lack of resistance. Uh, there was a there were two kinds of responses, it seemed. I mean, somebody mentioned that. Um, there, there's, they, it's not like they fought back with everything. And so I, my question would be, um, what, what would your reaction be to you know, um, this kind of invasion? Well, I mean, it's happening, but you choose a violent path or, or an alternate path. Is that a question out there for anybody or uh, I was asking the young man but uh, um, anybody, yeah. I would choose an alternate path, but if the alternate path wouldn't work, then I would most likely have to go to the violent path. I mean, if the, if nobody wants to listen to the alternate path, then what else is there to do? Lock and load, huh? <clears throat> I think the, the, the part of, the, uh, of an excerpt that I read from the book addressed that particular issue. Whoever the European governor was, you know, told the indigenous people, you know, you're going to feed us or we're going to kill you. And, you know, the response was, why would you kill us if you need us to feed you? You know? Um, so it's like, 
this whole idea of fighting back doesn't necessarily have to come from the perspective of violence. If it's food that you want from me, then, and I have it to give, is my giving it to you because you demanded it? No, uh, any less of um, an act of generosity on my part because you demanded something from me that I will give you anyway. Um, but then if I'm the one that's gonna feed you, Dumbass, why are you gonna kill me? <laughs> why, would, why, why would you do that? That just makes no sense, except that you are just a violent person who wants to kill anyway. And I think that is what the uh, hallmark of like colonialism has been wherever they have gone is to, I'm gonna just kill just because I have guns and you don't. Um, and it's not even a matter of my wanting something that you have is that you have something I don't. So I'm gonna want it because I don't have it. So let me just get you out of the way so I can have what I don't have, which is what you have. Um, I saw some of the things replaying and the parts that I read, you know, where, you know, we're just going to go into a, a social situation and declare these people the undesirables and treat them a certain way, kill them, whatever it may <clears throat> be, because we have guns. <laughs> I mean, we have dynamite, we have saltpeter, we have TNT, we have all that kind of good stuff. We have guns. And, you know, guns will, you know, do the job better any day than a bow and arrow. Um, and so yeah. Things like creeds like manifest destiny. Right? I, I come into a situation and I'm saying, okay, here's the law. And, you know, we're going to, you know, say God told us this or something like that. And all of this is ours. We're going to take it over. You people just have to move out of the way because we need to Christianize the world and all that other stuff. Is, oh Lord. They, 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 I'll say this and I'm done. <laughs> uh, the venerable. Eddie Murphy used to do a skit skit on uh, Saturday Night Live where he was a Jamaican singer. And he had this song he used to sing where he said, kill the white people. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and this particular piece cracked me up because the white people were sitting there like, oh my God. Oh my God. <laughs> and so there for me as a person of color who has some indigenous, you know, DNA, there's some things I cannot watch. This book is hard to read because I want to go kill the white people. And I know I can't do that. You know, I know I can't, I can't, I can't watch the Black Panther movie. You know, I can't watch Rosewood because, you know, I'm ready to burn some stuff down and, and all that kind of good stuff. But the whole idea that just because I want it means I should have it is like, I don't know a terrible tool mindset to live in. And I, on some level, I think that might have to be torturous. Um, one of the most interesting parts of the book for me was the piece about how did this culture of genocide and expansion come into being. And she argues that, uh, I think it was the Crusades was one element of that. And then out of that, that infighting, if you will, uh, uh, in Europe, some other things also <coughs> came into being, like privatization of uh, land, uh, the uh, uh, exploitation of labor, mm -hmm. and that these were uh, um, these were uh, elements of a particular way of living. And, and creating um, community, I use that in quotes, that was just transplanted here in the expansion. So, um, um, you know, if I get time, that's a particular place that I want to dig deeper into understanding what are some of the root cultural tenets that have led to this particular place we find ourselves. Uh, you know, the thing about history is that a person is telling a story, 
that shapes the, the narrative. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, in all places that are political, nation states, you make sure the narrative is told to uh, paint a particular picture for us all to believe. So, you know, a lot of us then have learned one version of the American expansion, mm -hmm. which required in order for us to believe and support it, that the indigenous people were uh, without civilization, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, that's, that's not something we should be mad about. That is uh, an intentional component of uh, empire. And that we're all uh, members of the of the empire. And so this is the story that we're believing without question. So uh, this author, along with others, uh, it's important to have people tell their own story by their own lens. Uh, to get in a different perspective about it. So, you know, the idea that human beings anywhere uh, are savage, <laughs> don't have civilization, mm -hmm. you know, how, what, what is that, is that possible? I mean, wherever you are, is that is that really a possibility that people are running around not uh, organized to, to take care of themselves in some form or fashion? So. So, so of course you had to do, start with the rebuild to say, well, wait a minute, these are people that have civilization, infrastructure, etc. So, uh, so last thing that I don't think I'm done, it's this thing about white privilege, and yes, uh, uh, there is white privilege as uh, some of the seniors here spoke so eloquently about. Um, that white privilege, though, at the end of the day, serves to latest version of the empire, which is what I call global corporate capitalism, uh, which then leads to where we find ourselves, all of us now, with the planet uh, at risk to uh, climate change, uh, the destruction of the planet for all living beings. I know you guys have kept up with Exxon, who they have exposed, knew the story in the 1970s uh, and kept it hidden. So I, I think some of the current global crisis that we find ourselves in provides us with an opportunity to deconstruct it, look closer at it, and then try to uh, find some ways to reestablish and recreate human civilization that's about um, being civil. So I've read the first 78 pages, that's what I've had. I've tried to I've tried to learn to manage my, my anger, but I only read this book in, in doses at a time, and then go back to it. Um, and then my wise mentioned the present. Charles, you alluded that in your opening statement, the parallels of of this, this book to the uh, climate. Uh, but yeah, I just feel like communities, you know, particularly communities of color, are the same thing. Hey, they're under siege and have, have never come out from being under siege. Uh, uh, and, and the police department, the state department, you know, we'll use Chicago, I can think of the latest activity where a young man was shot by the police officer and there was a citywide cover up uh, uh, to uh, keep this out of the, even with money, out of the, out of the public eye to after the elections. Just, there's this model of, um, of empire that uh, people of color, have, have, I mean, this ain't never changed. Uh, and when we talk about it, it is through the lens of the family structure, uh, black people, the black males are shooting up and killing each other. And so a rewrite of the story of our own humanity without looking at the, the containment of, of empire. So another word is and how uh, there's two types of uh, warfare. Uh, one was a low, was a low level, or the approach where you really just destroying the folk community's ability to feed itself. Economic so, warfare. Yeah, but contain. She used the word low in the book. I forget exactly what it is, but it was, it was a long range, slow walk to warfare, where you're removing this ability to sustain this community.
It's not the same thing taking place, you know, in, in the community here in the U.S. So. See, this, this book isn't yesterday. People talk about how hard it is to read. We could write the same book today. I would, I would be just as angry. Exactly. I mean, this isn't of the past. This is of the present. It's just different people, different contexts, different situations. It's the same thing. We, we talk about how hard it is to read this. We should be having the same difficulty reading day by day of what's happening in our world and the way our world works. We ought to be feeling the same kind of pain and anger. Well, the challenge with, with, with when you put it in historical context, you know, in the moment you can make believe, it's just a moment. We're gonna get past this. We're gonna select a new mayor. We'll get a new prosecutor. We'll get a new president. It's a fault. We'll wait on uh, 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 Bernie Sanders to win and save us all. Mm -hmm. So there's this illusion in the present that we can live in if we remove our historical context. But when you read books like this, that say, well, shit. Ain't stop. Ain't gonna stop. So it does create a different kind of despair and frustration and just fighting the present moment. Important, but I think that's that's what makes the pain uh, you know, somewhat different. Uh, also, another element of this, uh, this idea of warfare. You know, this is the early origins of you know U.S.'s war, like Afghanistan, Iraq, what's going on in countries like that, and even in places like Central and South America. They even use the word Indian country for foreign countries. You know, that's a, that's a, a that in actual military term that they use. This is Indian country, AKA so-and-so country. So a lot of its origins here, a lot of this, not all of it, but a, a deeper aspect and going along what you say, you know, and, um, what are some of the root elements? You know, I think one very obvious one is that revolution. You know, played a very, very, because that brought in the age of big banking. Big, big banking, the banksters, J.P. Morgan, Cornell uh, Vanderbilt, you know, uh, Leland Stanford. All the you know, New Pacific Railroads came too. This was another reason why those lands had to be available. We're going to put these, uh, your farm, what are you going to do about it? You know, she also talks about the buffalo, what the buffalo meant to these people. They were the protectors, but then here they go around, you know, you decimate this idea of protection for them. So now you're destroying their spiritual, cultural belief. All of these things, all of these concepts manifest destiny. You know, when Andrew Jackson threw out the proclamation, you know, for, okay, you know what, we're going to disregard, you know, blatantly, we're going to disregard all these treaties, you know, and we're going to take over your land. And then you force them in boxing to tell them, you know what, you can't be here anymore. You got to go again. So it's this idea that, you know, um, violence, you know, violence is always, you know, they even said it, you know, uh, the God Red Cloud, you know, when he said that, you know what, you white people, what I've noticed, and, it, and what was interesting is that he had never seen them, but when he encountered them, he said, you know what, you white people, all you do is leave a trail of blood wherever you go. They had no alternative. So I see what you're saying. There wasn't no alternative. We let you stay, then we're decimated. So we got to fight. So I think it's also important they, that they were also agents of their own liberation. You know, a lot of them didn't take it. A lot of them stand. You know, a lot of bravery. That you know, a lot of courage that, that it took. To, you know, to fight a war that I mean, eventually a lot of them knew it was inevitable that we'll lose. But, you know, we got to do something. So um, I think that you know that does have. I think that means something. Oh no, I just was agreeing with you. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I can keep going. Because but... <laughs> so, of what you're saying about a lot of about, about how a lot of that is forged, like that violence was forged here. Uh, I saw a presentation a while ago about how uh, a lot of the soldiers that fought in the invasion of Mexico in 1848 um, 
were like the generation after the people who took over literally like Indiana and Kentucky and Ohio. Uh, and that was just a really brutal conquest in this area specifically, um, where it, was, it would be like a dynamic of uh, there'd be some well, like white people would occupy the native people's land and then the, there'd be some misunderstanding and the white people massacre the entire village. Um, and so that's how the people who went and fought in Mexico were trained to think about natives. Um, and, and then they were also plot promised uh, loot, essentially. And so that's why it, was, it doesn't happen there. I told a girlfriend of mine, <clears throat> I have to stay away from downtown Indianapolis as much as possible because I remember when the only white people downtown were lawyers. <laughs> you know, that was all you saw. But it were the lawyers and then there were the homeless people. And I think about this within the context of what I'm seeing now. You know, it's like all oh, the white people have come back downtown and they have taken over. And yesterday it was like, you know, cargo khaki shorts and flip flops all over downtown. And I'm like, where did all these white people come from? They weren't here 15, 20 years ago. So, you know, they decided, well, we want downtown again. We want to come back downtown. So, you know what? Develop and run everything and everybody else out. And so my daughter who works at Panera has, <laughs> she says, you know, you can tell what people are going to order when they come in by what, what they're wearing. And she talks about, and this is just, you know, the whole idea of white privilege, you know, a woman going to the bathroom and using the bathroom and dropping her pad on the floor and walking out. Well, if you look at the people who are working in Panera, behind the counter, they're not the same people on the other side. So there's this idea of, oh, well, you know, I can go in here and use the bathroom and drop my pad and yeah, you go in there and clean it up. And that's the privilege I have. But then the homeless person comes into the Panera and, you know, for them to get a piece of bread or a drink or something like that, no. Panera is like white privilege. <laughs> in the downtown circle center, center mall. You have all this bread, we're gonna throw away, give away, do whatever, but you know, the homeless people can't have it. But lunchtime, white privilege comes flowing through the door. And we're gonna have this and I, and I just, you know, I tell people all the time when it comes to things like the land, you know, when a white person decides the land has value, that's when the land has value, you know. But my idea says, my own thinking says, white privilege only makes sense if I respond to it. Sitting beside Jim does nothing for me. Does it, Jim? No. <laughs> <laughs> Sitting beside Jim does nothing for me. But somewhere, and they're just saying, you know, in, in the black community, that the white man's ice is colder. Um, but, ice? Ice? Yeah, the white man's ice is colder. <laughs> <laughs> and more expensive. Yes, and more expensive. And so, but, you know, if I, if I understand that ice is ice is ice, then you know what? And I didn't say ice is ice is. <laughs> if I understand that, you know, white man, you can't walk in here and tell me, you know, screw my head off, pour sand in my neck and tell me I have brains and I'm suddenly smart. No, the only thing you have that I don't have is a gun. That's all you have. And that's what happened, I think, initially. But now you have come fast forward into a future where people believe Whatever the white man says, if the white man said it, it must be so. That's what happens in school with, you know, the history and the education. Or the white man said it, then it must, we can take it to the bank. Or, you know, I promise you, I can sit here. 
I think <laughs> I think this author is arguing that it's not just the gun. The <coughs> approach of um, how do you of violence. So I can have a gun and not necessarily decide to come in your community and kill everybody up. So uh, so it's more than just access. And and, and and that's part of what I'm saying. You know, that there's there has to be a psychology that goes along with it. Right. Where you come into the neighborhood and you say, no, it's not black, it's white. But then what inside of me says that I have to believe anything you say? Or what inside of me as a person of color wants to have what you have just because you have it? I have to live next door to you. That gives my life more value than living next door to this woman. Or, you know, you start thinking of names to call me like Squaw, you know, to devalue my womanhood uh, or Negress or, you know, whatever it might be to devalue my womanhood. Those kinds of things, I think, were a part of the, of the process. Um, but I, I, I believe that, that that's the part where people of color, um, especially in the day and age in which we live, have a little bit more say so about their response to it. Because I don't have to respond to white flight. I don't have to suddenly want to live downtown because it's full of white people. Or I don't have to suddenly want, you know, to go to Panera Bread because that's where all the white people go to eat. You know, Country Kitchen is good enough for me still. Or better. Yes. Well, um, what I wonder about kind of goes along with what Emma had brought up in terms of climate change, and that is that although a lot of this is, is culturally related, a lot of it's systems too, and, and uh, systemic racism and all the framework, economic framework that has made all of us slaves now. And uh, but with climate change coming, it's going to disrupt those systems. And so my question is, what does the future look like when those systems are, are no longer gone? The cultural stuff will still be here, but um, the political process will probably be broken down, the economic process, transportation, all these things are going to change dramatically. And it looks to me like at that point, the people who know how to grow their own food and live together in a community are the people who are going to be better off than those who have relied on the system to supply everything for them. Let me tie that back to the book again. Uh, folks didn't know how to grow their own food. They were living relatively peacefully. And the invader came in and said, you're going to feed me, I'm going to kill you. So system destruction is not a sure in a rebuild system change. It could in a day lead to a more sophisticated level of enslavement. So just with that, I think, I mean, if you look at the way wealth is being concentrated, has been concentrated, as like, we were saying, like Exxon News in 1970, <coughs> the climate change is coming, wealth has been progressively more concentrated there, you know, and that has you know, vastly increased since the 1970s. I mean, I think the system is preparing for climate change. You know, recognize what's coming. Well, um, another thing that um, I wanted to bring up about the book. Well. I brought up this idea about uh, going along with the system. Um, there's another book that came out uh, similar, not similar to this, but along the same topic, but Ebony and I, the history of universities in the US, and they're, you know, the ties to slavery, but more, but it's also tied to, you know, the decimation of, you know, indigenous people. And it talks about the psychological process, school, education, Christianizing it. The universities were the settlements where 
these indigenous people were to come in and they were to get and they were to Christianize them and tell them that you know um believing in this particular idea of Jesus, you know, will heal you or bring great wealth to your nation. And they believed it, you know, and they started to study Latin language, Latin culture. So again, you're you know, you're taking away some cultural relevance, their environment. There's no tie to it now. Psychologically, now this is what you're destroying. So now the next generation, you know, is forced to be dependent on whatever wealth, economic system. So this is a pattern. This is how they're going about it. We have to set up settlements, education. And going back to this idea of liberation, a lot of the you know indigenous knew this. They knew when towns and schools and settlements and government were taking place, you know, we either got to fight or just move on. So again, they found themselves psychologically in a place, you know, do we just leave, you know, uh, an individual part of the Southern Cheyenne black cattle, you know, it was called the peace leader. You know, he always found himself trying to figure out, you know, how do I keep my young men from rebelling? You find yourself in black culture with older generation, you know, black lives matter with the younger generation. And you have these older generation of civil rights people who are saying, no, protest, fight, put up the signs, you know, it's what we've been doing for 40, 60, 50 years. But the younger generation are like, no, you have not addressed our concerns. So I see this idea even then. Black cattle and Indians can't do this no more, Black cattle. We can't just be reserved to this reservation. Our food is out there. You let them kill our bison, we can't let that happen. So again, this is direct relevant, you know, this so intergenerational. Why are you saying that the civil rights leadership was? Clarify that, because what I'm saying is that the civil rights leadership, there seems to be a dichotomy, an age that where they have a different approach and methodology to go about things because it's been successful for them. It's been working for them. Polite protests, bring that up. Uh, but then you have Black Lives Matter that, that are not disinvaluing and saying that what they've done is not great. I think they, they recognize that, but they're saying is that we live in a day and age where our concerns, climate change, is a pressing matter. Income inequality, you know, the lack, the lack of diversity that we have in this world where jobs of STEM, jobs of room, you know, this is what a lot of the Black Lives Matter and movements such as Black Lives Matter are pushing for. So now you have this intergenerational conflict that we're trying to find a cohesion, a balance. In. And I see that in this book, you know, not with the U.S. per se, they were already, you know, they were, they were resolved in how they were going to get it done. But you saw this with the indigenous. If we move here, this is what this is what can gain. This is what can benefit us. You even saw it during the Civil War. They had to pick sides. You know, if we go with the Confederates, you know, we get our land back, but only to be betrayed by the same crooked Confederates after the war. But if we go with the Union, then we got to deal with these these northern industrialists who want to put you know railroads here. So they find themselves in a very peculiar situation. Now you find people of color today, black and brown people in the U.S. today, in a very peculiar situation. You know, how do I navigate this world when one, my, my skin color is used against me? There's walls that have been created to keep me here. So you know, it took great strategy, and I still think it's going to take great strategy. And you're always going to be, have to be innovative in this process, and that's what you saw. Innovative techniques then, you know, help. You know, some of them survive, and I think innovative techniques today are going to, you know, keep black and brown people, particularly in this world today, we live to survive. But I don't know what those look like, and I think discussions like this bring about those innovative ideas and strategies. <clears throat> she did mention resilience and all the tragedy, and all the tragedy was a resilience. And I think that's today, you know. Uh, Think of the family of, you know, um, Michael. The brother died in the same with Michael Brown. Um, he was on Charlie Rose a year ago. The question was asked, you know, how angry are you? And I thought it was a dumb question. I thought it was the dumbest question that Charlie Rose has ever asked. Like, you an intelligent white man, Charlie Rose. You should know that's a dumbass question. But he asked him, how angry are you? But you could, you could see in the father's face, he was angry, he felt rage. Because he asked him, what did you want to do? Kill somebody. There you go. Kill but he couldn't say it, right? No. Again, we find, you know, again, you know, again, at this time, you know, with black people, our rage always has to be confined at times. We always have to be strategic about that. And that's what I saw in his face, that if I that if I just go wild on your show, then I'm the angry black man. And then that goes along with the narrative that this was an angry black boy that should have been put down. He got it from his dad, his genetic. 
goes along with that pseudoscientific thing that they had back in the 19th century. You know, so again, this predicament that we, even victims, we find ourselves trying to find some type of solace in is hard for us. You know, you know, I'm so I mean, you know, I was just looking uh M sent out an email that the Black Panther, you know, the Black Panther, I mean, I mean that is a perfect example of resistance, a form of resistance. Now there were some flaws, but when you think about the things that really they were successful in doing, you know, those are models that I do think we have to go back, that we have to go back and look at. And I was and the one and I highlight the Black Panther film because I like the fact that it it highlighted the other narrative about resistance. That you don't always have to turn to cheap. There's other forms of resistance. The the indigenous people were socialist and the Europeans mm -hmm made socialism a bad word because capitalism was the word of the day, still is the word of the day. So when you look at um, <clears throat> models of civilization that are socialist in nature, like the most indigenous around the world, whether it's, you know, in the, in the, in the Polynesian countries, whether it's, uh, you know, in Australia, uh, these people use the land for what it would give them versus destroying the land for everything they could get out of it. And so if you look at you know, those kinds of paradigms or those kinds of types of constructs, those are the things that the white man has said, no, this is bad. Socialism is bad. Panthers were socialists, okay? So if, if, if We'll just say 90% of the, the world's civilizations are socialist civilizations. And then you come up with these white people saying capitalism is good. It's like, what have you been smoking? You know? <laughs> but where, where, you know, where in the book did capitalism become the right thing to do? You create economics, you create all of these imaginary things and sell them hook, line, and sinker, first to white people, okay? Then the white people become the traveling traveling evangelists, selling this snake oil of, you know, capitalism and, 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 and you know, innovation and civilization, whatever that is, you know, <laughs> that I have to have indoor plumbing to be civilized. That depends on who you ask, you know what I'm saying? Um, and then, you know, somebody buys into it. And it's like, oh, you know, well, it must be so, because the white man said it. Socialism, communism, the communal living, which is what I understand communism to be, communal living, mm -hmm. is what's worked for, you know, humanity for eons and eons. Uh, and, and things just really got bad when capitalism started rearing his ugly head. So, you know, when you had to go and demonize groups, you know, we'll say like the Black Panthers, because they're talking about being concerned. We're not even talking about, you know, we don't have things in our vernacular like getting a return on your investment and we need investors. I mean, you know, when I hear people start talking like that, mm, you lost me then because I know there's something up. <laughs> there's just something up that's not gonna benefit me. Or I won't even say benefit in the way of a gain or capital gains, but just in my daily living, there is something going on that's probably a little more sinister. And I'll, I'll also add though, I would say Western capitalism. I think there's always been a form of capitalism no matter where you went around the world, ancient or even present. I think there was always some type of idea of commodity and exchange. So. Uh, I would say Western form of capitalism is a very, very, very corrupt system. That's what I, that's I would what. agree with that. Uh, Mimi, I know you said you read, did you have any? Did you have anything? I know you said you read some of the book. Did you have anything, an insight, perspective to say? Yeah, I think, I think the, what I talked about earlier is one of the strongest impacts it's had on me just reflecting more on 
how traditional education in this country is really, um, I'm looking for a certain word. A hoax. Bad. <laughs> <laughs> um, a lie. But particularly like strategic brainwashing to um, indoctrination. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's uh, the narrative that children are taught in this country is just full of lies. Um, so I think I think a lot of young people who learn critical thinking skills or have some exposure to different narratives are inevitably are set up to have this kind of fall from grace, um, which uh, I don't believe that's all very confused. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then um, it sort of reminds me of uh, Tony C. Coates talking between the world and me about, you know, his looking for answers throughout history to say, okay, this narrative is wrong, so what is the right story? But then it's it's never that simple. There are so many different narratives, and they're not in agreement with each other um, about what is the story of what has happened and where we go next. Uh, so to me, this book is a really important piece of another narrative to to answer questions. And so I'm I'm still finding myself asking. So what do I do? What do we do? Um, and we're talking about white privilege and, um, and I feel the same anger and um, frustration and all the things that Jim was talking about. If I benefit from this. Um, you know, this has gotten me so many of the things that um, I have in my life and that, that I get every day. Um, and so how how do you move in this other world? Um, I don't know, I find myself asking that question every day. Um <clears throat> I wanna add on to what Mimi was talking about about uh, the strategic brainwashing. Mm -hmm. Um so I'm in high school, I'm a sophomore. Uh, first semester, I took this class called African Studies. Now, when you hear the class African Studies, you would expect a uh, African male to teach that class. But no, not at my school. White teacher, white lady. Yes, a white lady. And during the whole class, she really only the main story about it was really about slavery. That's all. She never talked about the achievements that we had. She never talked about uh, politics or nothing like that. She just talked about slavery. Like, she talked about the slave ships, she talked about slave trade, she talked about all that, but nothing else. Like, that's basically what the whole class is about. No so, more Garvey. No, 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 that, no, Edgar Meg or Megger Evers, no, none of that. So, so what did you, I was just, how did that make you feel, man? Um, I was, I was, I was very upset because, I mean, is that? I guess that's what they're teaching now in this day and age. Like, I'm 16 now, and I know my dad teach me better if he was a teacher. Like, he'll teach, he try to teach as many black kids or adults as he can as possible. And I know he he was not happy when he heard what I told him. Because uh, my sister took the same class as me, but we had different periods. And he was not happy at all. And he said something to the school about it, too. No, sir. I think one one piece that uh, sticks out to me as something to uh, to build on is what M talked about with. Uh, this the and in the book the, the culture of um, um, 
it's like the second or third chapter. It's culture of conquest. Um, how it's, and she talks in the book how uh, the, a lot of the, the setup for colonization was kind of this ugly birth of capitalism, global capitalism. Um, and I think that is really, uh, to me, seems one of the largest engines that is perpetuating the inequalities and um, the, the injustices of the past today. Um, and so when I'm asking what, uh, what can I do, I am definitely looking a lot at, at different models. Um, you know, that are in direct opposition to capitalism and um, finding other people who are philosophically aligned um, and working together um, and trying to build alternative ways of being in community and of being successful, supporting uh, ourselves and each other. Um, and trying to get away from exploitation, but that, that is the model of the global economic system. So it's very challenging, but at least taking steps for me is finding other people who are trying to do the same thing. Um, that is one of the things when you were talking about the psychological roots of of the practices, I was thinking about this um, experiment that I read about where they um, looked at gift giving and they compared how Europeans and Canada and I think um, maybe Asian Americans responded to the experience of getting a gift. And so um, in the Asian, the Asian Americans by and large didn't accept the gift from an acquaintance because it would create a sense of obligation, that they felt a sense of obligation if they were to receive. But the European um, Europeans in Canada, they were fine accepting the gift and they didn't feel a sense of obligation. And I, it made me think about our sense of connectedness. So these were, these weren't gifts from friends or family. They weren't gifts from like, strong relationships. These were gifts from people that we barely know. And like, do we feel a sense of obligation to return that gift? Do we feel indebted to that person? Or do we not? And so I wonder sometimes if part of the psychological roots of some of this stuff is a sense of obligation that people are inculcated to feel when regardless of how close they are to another person, you know, emotionally. So anyway, I don't know. It made me think about what that question you had about the psychological roots. And I wondered if a sense of obligation is a part of that at all. I, I would like to tie that along with, you said the sense of obligation, yeah. is the sense, but I tie that to the earth. You know, The mm -hmm. earth gives us so much mm -hmm. daily. How do we replenish that? You know, how do we get back to the earth? What is our responsibility? You talked about, our, you know, what is our job? What are, I think one of our jobs is to be conscious of how we treat this earth. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a very, uh, Dunbar Ortiz highlights that with indigenous, how they saw the earth. You know, um, years ago, we were watching that documentary with the Wampanoag and how, talked about how the trees were rooted in the ground, but how they saw themselves as those trees because of the rootness in the ground. And that's how, from which they got their origin of where they came from. So. When Europeans came on the land and started decimating the lands and started digging up the sacred bodies and butcher, this was this was foreign to them. Like you know, because them they saw humanity through this lens at all because they were peaceful. Everybody else was peaceful. Mm -hmm. So when this psychological <coughs> warfare came, where we're going to take your land, we're going to start business, we're going to create merchant, we're going to just go through all your neighborhoods and back routes and just destroy everything and create this, you know, it uprooted them, mm -hmm. you know, and it. Again, it, it deepened, you know, this uh, it deepened this sense of white privilege, you know, and this I, again, there were so many themes in this book about, you know, what and then what I but the one thing I do want to highlight is that uh, 
She also said that these were also cultures prior to European expansion. They fought with each other too. There were, I mean, there were warlike clans and tribes and groups, you know. And then so they didn't try to decimate each other. No, 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 but, each other out. no, no, no. That's not the point I want to highlight. What I want to highlight is that I do, I do think we do them an injustice if we don't give them the diversity that is credited to them. To try to romanticize this culture and say they were all just peaceful. No, I think that does them injustice. I think to say that they were a group of humans no different from any other human culture in the on earth that had conflicts and differences. Yes, you know, they didn't decimate each other, but they had conflict. And then, but there was a way to deal with it. I do agree with you. But I think with this idea of European expansion, when they came in, because they were so going back with the saying, you know, when we talk about Europe. Women, they were land resource and poor. They just came out of a dark age. They didn't know what the hell was going on with the rest of the world. So when they heard of these stories coming back from the Crusades, like Amber alluded to earlier, there's, you know, I mean, there even one place that there were seven cities of gold in the Americas. When a guy gets there, he finds they're just indigenous people who are just agricultural farmers. So he's, you know, he's decimated. So this creates this tension and this anger that has to be displaced somewhere. Because y'all don't have gold, and this is what I'm going to do. We're going to create an economy in this system. But now you're going to owe us for this land for not having gold. And if you don't have it, we'll chop your hands off. You know, we'll impel your kids. So this was the system, this culture of violence, psychologically, systematic. This was all this was all done as like a pattern, a policy later. It became policy. It became actual policy to eradicate Indians and steal their land. So I, you know, I think this is a, so when we ask what is our job, I think our job is to commemorate, reflect on that, think about that. You know, each time that we step onto the earth, there were people that saw this earth that we're on today. You know, the name Indiana means home of the Indians, you know. We should, we should think about that. You know, that there was one people here. I mean, one of the great massacres in U.S. history was the Battle of Tippecanoe, Southern Indiana. William Henry Harrison, I believe, whose grave is right up there, Crown Hill. Indian killer. An actual Indian killer. She called it what it is. And they're not going to teach you in school because it empowers you. It gives you the narrative of the what the of what the, how the indigenous you know as a historian i read you know i'm always researching and the one thing that i always found interesting is that when they tell their story everything is just white men this no names but just he's a white man he was a white devil he was a white man but that but that goes back to what him was saying but that's their narrative and they're valid for their narrative they're just a and I think that having these conversations and hearing these various perspectives are the process of that narrative, of being of being able to interpret our own history and empower empower ourselves through our own history. It's important. You know, history is a very, very, very useful weapon. Jane Elliott makes a point um, in one of her videos I see on YouTube where she asks a room that's half filled with white people which one of you on any given day is going to give up your whiteness to be treated like a person of color? And, you know, you hear responses from white people like, well, you know, if they would just act like this or do that, or, no, we're not talking about behavior, we're talking about your white skin. Who's going to give up their white skin? Any hands go up? Of course not. I mean, who's going to give up privilege when they have it? So I think indigenous people, people of color, when you start talking about white allies, I'm sure there are some. But I had one. I saw I pulled a race card on me one day, and I was like, you know what? I'm done. But you know, that was just one experience <laughs> that one person had. I think that, um, you know, um, empowerment, self-actualization, all those kinds of things, understanding your culture, your history, your, all those kinds of things are really, really, really important when you talk about what is your response to this going to be? Because white people can't stop being white. Just no more than I can stop being black. And if I'm given the choice between exercising a privilege that I have, that I don't see necessarily as hurting the person next to me, it's just, you know, a little fringe Benny that I have. I don't think I'm going to give that up. You know, I like being a black woman. I don't think I'd give that up so easily. So, 
understanding the, 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 the corporate responsibility that people have, understanding the cultural responsibility that we have, understanding the responsibility that we have to the earth, and understanding that, historically speaking, and history is the best predictor of future patterns of behavior. The white man has raped, decimated, wiped out, depleted resources, and all those kinds of things. So if we're going to say we need to create a society where those kinds of things don't happen, then we have to stop buying to the paradigms of people who are teaching us that this is the way you live in a disposable, you know, easily replaceable world. It's that's not how you live. It's just not how you do it. That's a that's a big challenge <laughs> to teach uh, that we don't ideally we don't live in a in a disposable world. <clears throat> um, well, I I wanted to connect with what uh, Anne mentioned earlier about the chapter which I haven't read yet, but apparently it deals with uh, this this model that the European colonizers developed to impose on, on societies that they were colonizing. And, and I mean, it's, it's been refined over the centuries into this very effective model and it, it changes shape. And I'm thinking that maybe they're trying to get away from, well, just wiping out, you know, whole civilizations and genocide. And, and they, it is becoming a more sophisticated um, model of uh, domination. And the reason why you, know, you don't you don't wipe out who you're colonizing is so that you can dominate and, and enslave, and you have human capital, and um, that's the part of capitalism that that worries me that uh, that is so hard to teach. And I think it's that's at the root of what you're saying about. Um, you know, learning responsibility to community, to earth, to, to others, as opposed to the self, because it's this self model, this, um, you know, the American uh, uh, dream of, of the, uh, well, the libertarian model is, concerns me because it, the part of that that says, I mean, there are some parts of it that are that are arguable, but the part of it that says that the individual is worth more than the community, than the, the common good, I think that's at the basis of uh, the, the difficulty of teaching the kind of responsibility that you mentioned. Um, and what I'm <clears throat> trying to figure out is how have uh, most of us become so complicit in our own enslavement. That's, you know, that's that's what's happening as we swallow the, the pill of the capitalist society that, that we live in and that we uh, practice our lives in, we're, we're really perpetuating that, that model. How do we get away from that? That's pretty tough. <coughs> Was that, a, was that a question? Or? Yeah. No, 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 just a, okay. <laughs> I want to respond to it though, but I don't want to dominate the conversation. That's what I was, because I would like to respond to that question to myself. It's Joe, no. so I'm glad you, I'm glad, <laughs> but I'm glad you heard me, so I'm glad you heard me, so. Brother here. Well, um, as a young person, um, why do so many of your brothers and sisters, uh, or just in general, brothers and sisters, uh, seem to succumb to the allure of uh, our modern capitalist society and, and all of the principles it stands for? Trade collection. <laughs> 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 
I have two sons, and one uh, graduated from Purdue, and one from IU, and they both were business administration, and I actually saw them evolve into capitalism. Mm -hmm. And uh, they are just awful. <laughs> they are. They're, they're terrible, but they have. They just accepted that. They they were taught <laughs> that's the best way to go, and that's what they are. Both of them. One is forty four. One is forty seven. And I just I just look. I'm just amazed at how they were indoctrinated at, at that level. <laughs> This was my son. He's a senior at Rego School. Yeah. 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 Yeah becoming um, um, indoctrinated and then becoming colonized by the prevailing capitalist business system. There are alternatives, but why? What is it about the capitalist system that is so um, that that allows it to be so dominant and allows it to squeeze out these? Uh, other alternatives that so many of us are trying to push forward. Um, I think it depends on how a person like, comes up in life. You know, hmm. how our sons were like, they were educated, <laughs> and then after they got out, they changed, came to good people. And then I think it's how like the society pushes people. Um, they push people to change, mm -hmm. and like you know, how they say like the young black man muscles will be bald. Rappers or something like that. They won't be big or something like that. Like it's different in different cultures and different people, like different people. For some people, the young man when they make business, or you send their signals to another man who wants to be a rapper, or he wants to be like he wants to be bigger than other people. He wants to become something that he has he hasn't had. It's like mm. it's different in different people. But like. Her son, one thing, and then maybe had a different aspect in life, but it was teaching, it was schooling, he became a different person. It just depends on the person, how they see life, on how they grasp that. Swinging those strange not easy things, too. I mean, we're social beings. So, you know, there's different. You know, this model will kill you. You mm -hmm. resist it, it kills you. People remember that. Mm -hmm. Every day we are faced with making decisions. And in some cases, those decisions. Uh, if you have um, mothers who are worried about their sons and their, and their distance, then you know it impacts how you educate and condition. To be the minority rule, not the majority rule. Even with, with the indigenous Americans, we talked about you know that uh, exists. But if we think corp global corporate capitalism is just going to lay down, it's delusional. And if we think that one or two of us, because we stand up, is going to be enough. Um, so, you know, and her sons, who she has some frustration about, they went to two of the finest colleges you can imagine, but they're not being trained to, to revolt or to change. They're being trained to get along with and, and, and swim, swim in the water. You know, during the height of life prior to the civil rights movement, there was a uh, 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 community uprising 
Uh, but as soon as there was some, some curtailment through prison and assassinations uh, and other, and then some trinket, ongoing trinket distribution to the, to the neo colonialists who exist to this day, who then say, oh, go along, get along, get your education, and you too can uh, have some trinkets. Have some trinkets. <laughs> you know, it's, it's massive and it's huge. Uh, and it's been going on for a very long time. So um, right now we see some of that pushback through uh, uh, Beyonce, who, who has betrayed uh, uh, some elements of uh, corporate capitalism with her, her um, attack on the, the flag. Um, she did her recent video, or uh, Kendrick Lamar's Piece, you see, even see within that artistic community, and we're not talking about poor people. We're talking about some 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 rich hip hoppers who are, are beginning to 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 at least raise up the issues of, of white supremacy and uh, the slow corporate capitalism through their art form. And some of that might even be tied to the fact that they too are being locked out. Uh, capitalism. You look at Jay Z and the whole thing with Title, uh, and their efforts to, to build their own form for distribution, and all the pushback they got. So, uh, you know, the come, resistance comes over in waves, um, and, and we have to just take a very, very long road, long journey in our, in our efforts to, to resist, reclaim, and renew uh, not only our humanity, but of the world. So. One of the things I this like young man, one last thing, this young man here, I've known him since uh, he came out of the womb. I know his mother. He's a good friend of mine. She came here a few days ago and uh, raised on, uh, we'll just say, having some particular challenges in a particular class. And uh, I said, well, invite him out here. And if he don't get out here, we will be on the doorstep. And he didn't make it last Sunday, so I called him yesterday and said, hey, your son didn't come last Sunday. I said, he resisting? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's not trying to say, you tell him I need to see him today. Mm -hmm. Let him know that you're not, you're not responsible for this. I'll put the call out, and if he don't make it, we're going to come over to the house. So that's how you build community and build resistance. And if we do this well, when he gets to be 30, Years old, he's gonna have at least some of that within him by this responsibility. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Um, I had my first daughter when I was 18 years old, and I believe one of the things that I had to do to be a good mother was to stop watching television. Mm -hmm. And so, 35 years ago, I stopped watching television. Television is one of the worst <laughs> indoctrinators um, to free thought or, or, or to, um, that's not what I'm trying to say. It's anti-free thought. <clears throat> but with the whole idea of being a mother and feeling like television was <clears throat> a big part of the thing that I needed to overcome. Now, as a more senior adult when I'm around television, I find out the same things they were doing on the young the rest of us 30 years ago, they're still doing now. So I'm like, what have I missed? What, do, what, what kind of idiot do you have to be to watch this? I mean, day after day after day. Well, along with that, I was a breastfeeding mother. And I learned 35 years ago that one of the things that happens when you hear your baby cry is your milk lets down, okay? And one of the things that happens as a breastfeeding mother is anybody's baby can cry and your milk will let down, okay? It's the, the, they, the, the breasts don't discriminate. But in the world that we live in, we're taught to believe that breasts, number one, are sex organs, okay? And that it is just horrible for you to pull one out and feed your baby in public. 
How do we get these ideas? Who told us that? Who, I mean, what makes you think, you know, you can walk around with your shirt off and I can't? And the only time we see women with their breasts out of there, you know, in Africa somewhere. I think they have a good idea there. But these ideas that we see in what we call the media, whether it's television, whether it's print media, whether it's the audio media, these things are feeding into these ideas of what's good, what's right, what's appropriate, what's inappropriate. You know, we get these experts, you know, every 30 seconds that tell us, you know, hey, you know what, pulling your breasts out in public is just nasty, it's nasty. Well, you know what? <laughs> if I were a breastfeeding mother now and somebody's baby cried, you know what? If the mother wasn't around, I'd feed it. They say that's nasty. But white man let mammy feed his baby. And when you talk about it being something that the slave master said is okay, that's good. But no, not if we're saying this is how we nurture our community. This is how we build up, this is how we fortify, this is how we do life. We take care of each other in, a mo in the most natural way that we can. Um, any closing statements, comments? Um, I was going to say, uh, maybe think about, um, I think a couple of comments you talked about, like what type of idiots continue to watch this, which is similar to what you were just saying about, um, why would people be so complacent and accepted, accepting? And one of the things I was thinking about is if we look at it in comparison to basically just drug addicts, not necessarily idiots or even accepting, but you know, if you just drop off of the idea that I can have more, consume more, or one day be more than where I'm at, or be on top, it allows you to uh, go along with the process. Is off the strength of that I may be able to be at the top of the pyramid. And then if I'm not there yet, I can continue to dilute my senses by continually consuming. Um, and hopefully it'll fill that void by uh, continuing to How do you change? How do you change it? Uh, well, you have to start with your personal behaviors. So uh, internal dialogues with yourself about why do I purchase things? Who do I purchase them from? Why do I even have this desire to purchase this? Uh, what does it say about uh, my intentions or what my value is built on? Um, and then how do you feel when you go without those things? How does it make your life feel? Uh, how does it make you impact, uh, interact with other people? Um, so I think that's one way you start to uh, uh, turn the mirror inward and really try to look at your addictions. Uh, that's really what it's become. Um, uh, it's also related to the principle of competition that we're inculcated with. Well, I um, wanted to say thank you guys for the conversation, great conversation. Oh, him. Uh, just a PSA when you get done. Okay. <laughs> uh, I was, thank you for the conversation, enjoy it. I hope we do a part two of this sometime soon with the author. It's like, you know, thank you, Cameron KI, guys. Thank you. Right. So, uh, four o'clock today, uh, we have another a special uh, book discussion featuring some of the uh, young African American males. We're leading a discussion uh, on how to use coach book. Uh, so, please uh, hang around for that. I do see one of the presenters here. Would you like to do a quick commercial about the event, Uh Yeah, to get four different perspectives uh, off of the different parts of the book and kind of analyze and try to take two topics out of those sections. I think we're about 40, 45 pages each uh, that we're going to analyze and talk about to have a very pointed conversation about the book. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, it's memoirs that he wrote to his son. And, uh, and examines a lot of things that's going on in the um, state of America today. And so you get four perspectives from four different age groups, four different young men. Come out loud. Four o'clock today, so stick around, have some coffee. Uh, we have next Sunday, three o'clock. Uh, we are uh, 
hosting a nine-month series on gentrification, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Uh, it's a uh, joint drink between us and Spirit and Place Festival. And our goal is to talk about gentrification from a local perspective, uh, a national perspective, international perspective, through the various lenses of economics, education, and culture. Next Friday, uh, we have a listening class discussion party. And Mimi, could you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. Friday the 26th at 6 p.m., we will be listening to Kendrick Lamar's album, Pencil Butterfly. Yes. Are you listening to it yet? Yes. Everyone should listen to it. Um, it's an amazing piece of work, Kendrick Lamar's genius. And uh, we're going to talk about it. We're going to talk about all the different meanings you can take from it and just uh, appreciate the craft and uh, music together. So 6 p.m. Friday the 26th. And the following Friday we have a discussion featuring a uh, student from the PATR education program. Professor, could you just tell me about this series? Uh, we have five community education forums. We've done two. There was one this last Friday. We've got three more coming in the spring. Uh, four urban ed or five urban ed studies doctoral students work with KI youth and adults to develop a educational forum on Friday nights. So please join us. And last but not least, this is a community sponsored community funded initiative. If you guys don't feed the tank, the fish tank back there. Our website or support our website and uh, uh, social media company. We won't have these conversations going forward. And you can say, I remember when Marcus Garvey tried that with the Black Star Line, it didn't work. <laughs> ooh, ooh, ooh. So please support our work uh, in any form or fashion you can. And Alvin, if you could take a quick minute and say a little bit about the KID Media Initiative. So uh, Canon Media is our empowerment enterprise, so we build websites, uh, we do graphic design, print design, pamphlets, business cards, logos. Uh, uh, we also do social media, media work. Uh, today we had me and the app work on the live streaming. We also do videos where we do short promotional videos about organizations or about businesses. So if you know anyone, uh, please pass the word on. Um, we have cards that we're going to pass around. Please uh, make sure they find a home somewhere. If you can't use our services, spread the 